Okay, so um, the, the second paper is um, titled uh, Exploratory Laparoscopy at the Level 1 Trauma Center, uh, Fewer Laparotomies and Shorter Hospital Stay. The paper is going to be presented by Dr. Soka from the University of New Mexico. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, I don't have any disclosures to report. I also wanted to thank Sages for allowing us to present our research. I'd like to start with a, a brief history of trauma laparoscopy. In 1925, Dr. Short uh, said that laparoscopy would be a good method to determine the presence or absence of blood in the abdomen in the case of a traumatic ruptured viscous. About 25 years later, Dr. Ruddock, who is a British surgeon, uh, again thought laparoscopy would be a good means to evaluate for intra-abdominal injuries following explosions, crush injuries, or falls. Uh, 20 years following that, Dr. Hesselson is a South uh, African trauma surgeon, and uh, from what I can tell, he's the first to really publish a series on laparoscopy for abdominal trauma. Uh, skip forward 45 years, and that brings us to today, and uh, trauma laparoscopy uh, still remains a fairly controversial subject. Uh, even though it's about 90 years old, uh, critics still will say it's a technique in search of uh, an indication. Uh, modern trauma laparoscopy really consists of uh, three separate procedures and exploratory laparoscopy um, is really an umbrella term. So the first is a screening laparoscopy where uh, you use a scope in a stable trauma patient and any evidence of injury, even two drops of blood, you're going to immediately convert to an open exploratory laparotomy. Uh, the second is a diagnostic laparoscopy, and this is the equivalent of a minimally invasive x lap where the team would evaluate all four abdominal quadrants. They would run the bowel and uh, assess and uh, identify all injuries in the abdomen uh, and then decide whether further treatment is uh, indicated. Finally, there's therapeutic laparoscopy where uh, you detect and repair all injuries in a minimally invasive fashion. Uh, we hypothesized that uh, exploratory laparoscopy in stable trauma patients would result in fewer laparotomies and that it may affect the hospital length of stay and lead to a shorter hospital length of stay. Uh, we looked at our New Mexico trauma data from 2012 to 2013 and identified trauma patients who had documented blunt or penetrating injuries that underwent abdominal exploration. And from that group, we found 29 patients who underwent exploratory laparoscopy. Uh, within that uh, patient group, uh, there were 12 patients who underwent the screening laparoscopy, meaning uh, the scope was used and usually hemoperitoneum diaphragmatic injury or peritoneal violation was identified and the, the patients then underwent an open intervention. Within that group, only nine had true injuries that required further surgery and three uh, had smaller things like a blunt uh, splenic or hepatic injury that didn't require uh, further intervention. We performed diagnostic laparoscopy on 16 patients. 12 had no injuries, and again, four had injuries, but they were hemostatic uh, contusions and did not require any open procedure. Finally, we performed a therapeutic laparoscopy in one patient, uh, repairing a diaphragmatic hernia with intracorporeal suturing techniques. Uh, we wanted to look at uh, our use of laparoscopy, and the patients in 2012 and 2013 were relatively evenly matched. The 2013 group was slightly older, and their injury severity score was slightly higher. Uh, when we look at our procedures, our use of laparoscopy increased from 3 to 14 over a two-year period, and that was a significant change. We also saw a a uh, significant decrease in the negative laparotomy or non-therapeutic laparotomy rate. Uh, when we compared hospital stay between these two groups, we saw that the patients treated with laparoscopy had a significantly shorter hospital length of stay and ICU length of stay, and there was no difference in complications. 
Now, when we looked at a subgroup analysis and compared our negative laparotomy patients with a negative laparoscopy patients, there was a one-day difference in hospital stay between the two groups, but it was not significant. Um, we believe that the both groups had a long hospital stay for their associated injuries, extremity injuries, contusions, wounds, etc. Um, this led us to conclude that as our use of emergency laparoscopy increased, there was a decrease in total and negative laparotomies performed. We had no missed injuries in our laparoscopy group. And uh, the benefits of a minimally invasive approach in these stable trauma patients was a shorter hospital length of stay with no increase in complication rates. Uh, currently, uh, we are uh, duplicating our study design using national data. And uh, we do feel that additional studies are needed to further support the use of trauma laparoscopy. Uh, the paper is open for discussion from the floor. I have a, I have a question. Uh, one of the benefits potentially of trauma laparoscopy is the, uh, what you see in short and long-term follow-up, that is uh, prevention of dehiscence, enterocutaneous fistulas, hernia formations, things that are going to require additional intervention in the future. Do you have any information about how, that, how these groups compared? Because I, I don't think we'll ever get away from negative laparotomies or mm -hmm. negative laparoscopies. Um, yeah, we don't have, unfortunately for our cohort, we don't have long-term follow-up. Uh, I will say that uh, in terms of the literature, there's more and more data coming out about the morbidity of trauma laparotomy. And uh, I believe uh, somewhere around 40% for uh, patients who undergo laparotomies have uh, complications of some sort, whether it's ileus, pneumonia, atelectasis. And uh, one study recently came out that said even with a non-therapeutic laparotomy, 25% of patients will have some form of complication. I have a question. <clears throat> Very nicely presented. Uh, three questions, actually. Did you have any concerns or alter your protocol based on uh, worries of CO2 getting intravascular. Uh, so that's one question. Second question, can you tell us how penetrant this is in the trauma world? I mean, is this being used? And the third question would be, where would you place this in the overall protocol? Because there's some patients that obviously just have to go straight to the operating room. There are others that fall into this category. Um, absolutely. So uh, regarding the CO2 embolus is, is what you're referring to. So uh, there is a, a concern when, you're have, when you have open venous vessels during, in a trauma patient that if you were to insufflate with CO2, you can cause an embolus and, you know, even a stroke. Uh, for us, I think that's a great question. Uh, Normally those patients who would have a massive vessel injury are gonna be unstable, and so uh, they would not be candidates for uh, laparoscopy. I mean, the, count the contraindications for trauma laparoscopy are hemodynamic uh, instability, uh, traumatic brain injury because CO2 insufflation can uh, cause an increase in intracranial pressure. Um, also, I think those are sort of the main ones. Your second question was about... How, how many trauma surgeon, surgery groups across the country are actually using laparoscopy? Um, you know? well, it's a good question. So I'm currently kind of reviewing the data, and, you know, it's ironic because this issue comes up every 10 years in terms of the literature, and uh, you see... Um, groupings of papers that are published every 10 years taking this subject on. And the two most recent reviews, uh, one is a systematic review um, and another uh, just a review of the literature, their conclusion is there really are only small case studies, um, you know, between 20 and 500 patients that are usually retrospective. And the critique is usually that there needs to be more prospective data gathered. And uh, one thing that we're seeing over the past 15 years is the amount of 
uh, studies being published is actually increasing at a very, you know, when you graph it out, it's, it's, it's going up. So I believe more and more places are doing it. And the third question was? You got, you got it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Sharon Shiraga from Sacramento, California. I have a question, uh, you know, with uh, where I went, went through residency, most of the trauma surgeons are pretty reluctant to do laparoscopy mm -hmm. uh, for multiple reasons, kind of the culture of the field. Um, how, how was your experiencing uh, with getting your trauma team started doing this and how would you mo uh, promote this or how would someone promote their trauma team to do more laparoscopy uh, for, the, for the trauma surgeons patients? Yeah, we noticed uh, a correlation of some newer faculty arriving to our trauma center and starting to take call. And this faculty had a little bit more minimally invasive training. And uh, those few individuals were open to performing laparoscopy and uh, helped us, you know, uh, pursue that. I will say it, it is extremely controversial topic um, in the trauma community. And I believe that because our, our newer trainees and residents, everyone is getting uh, more exposure to laparoscopy and residency, that I think in the future uh, we'll be able to pursue kind of studying it more. Um, the, the generation of trauma surgeons who, you know, did not grow up with FLS and uh, that sort of training obviously are not comfortable with that, and uh, I don't blame them. Thank you.